All right, this is notes 4.1, the sun and the climate and how the sun influences the climate. Go ahead and get out your notes 4.1 from uh, your packet that you should have. All right. So uh, we're going to go through how exactly uh, the sun influences different climates and biomes. This is the start of unit four. And unit four is about... Um, biomes, and we're going to learn what uh, those are. All right. So a couple of terms that we need to know for uh, these notes, and you can follow along on your packet and fill this out. Okay. So first is you need to remember that an ecosystem consists of all the biotic and abiotic factors interacting in a particular place. Okay. Uh, remember biotic and abiotic, it's living and non-living. Okay. A biome is an ecosystem or biomes are ecosystems with similar biotic and abiotic characteristics. Okay. So it's just biomes are different locations that have similar ecosystems. Okay. So for instance, uh, I've lived in a couple different temperate forests, okay? Temperate forest uh, was the biome where I was when I lived in Ohio. So at the top is a picture there of Massey's Creek, which was a creek nearby where I lived, okay? So that was a temperate forest where there were, basically it just means seasonal forest. The forest changes leaves, uh, the, the leaves change color in the fall. Okay, same thing here. When I'm living in Germany, I'm also living in a temperate forest. Okay, now these are different ecosystems, but are they the same biome? Yes, okay, they're different ecosystems, but the same biome, meaning they're different locations and the specific animals in Condren aren't interacting with the specific am animals in Ohio, but they're going to be pretty similar and they're going to be pretty similar plants and animals because they're the same biome. Okay. Um, different ecosystems, but the same biome. Okay. Let's just take a quick look at Condren's biome here. Okay. The exact name of Condren's biome is a mixed temperate forest. Okay. What does mixed mean? Uh, mixed basically means it has deciduous trees. Okay. So deciduous is um, leaves that fall in the fall or in autumn, the leaves change color and they fall off the trees. Okay. And then you have conifer trees, uh, which are usually evergreen, right? You have ever, they're always green throughout the winter. Even now they still have their leaves. Okay. So they don't change color. So it's mixed. It has both deciduous and conifer. In this picture, here's a picture of the Condren forest. You can see that you've got um, kind of leaves changing color here at the bottom. So those are some beech trees, it looks like maybe. Then you've got some evergreen trees at the top. So that's a specific biome that we're in. Temperate just means that it experiences seasons, okay? We have warm summers, we have cold winters, springs and the autumns in the middle are medium. Um, so temperate just refers to the fact that we're experiencing seasons, okay? Um, so yeah, biomes are determined by climate. So there's many different examples of biomes. So here's a couple examples that you can see at the bottom of this illustration. Okay. Uh, for instance, you have the desert is a type of biome. The tropical forest is a type of biome. Savanna. Uh, you can write down a couple of these examples underneath one on your notes. You have um, a space for some examples. So choose a couple and write those down. Okay, chaparral is another biome. You see that a lot in the Mediterranean or the bottom of Australia or South Africa. Okay, uh, temperate grassland. Okay, you see that in the middle of America or in some parts of Central Asia. Temperate broadleaf forest. Okay, you see um, those are more like jungles. Okay, coniferous forest, also known as boreal forests, um, a lot of pine trees in those areas. You see those more up north, like in Canada and Russia. You see the tundra, um, even more north than that. So these are all examples of different biomes, similar ecosystems that have similar climatic factors that influence the type of plants and animals that they have, okay? Now, um, as we think about 
these things, you have to remember that climate does not equal weather. They are not the same thing. Think about what is the difference? Well, climate is the prevailing weather conditions in an area over an extended period of time. And that's the blank that you have there, okay? Number two, climate is the prevailing weather conditions in an area over an extended period of time. So it's a long-term thing, whereas weather is more of a short-term thing, okay? It's the average day-to-day, -day, it's a day-to-day -day changes in temperature, okay? All right, so for instance, if I say it rained in Germany today, is that a climate or a weather statement? That's a weather statement. I'm talking about today, what happened, okay? If I say Germany has cold winters, okay, is that um, a uh, climate or a weather statement? So it's a climate statement, okay? Every year we expect the winter to be cold, definitely colder than the summer, okay? It's just a climate thing. Um, it's a long-term what we expect, okay? Which do you think is easier to predict? Well, climate is usually a lot more easy to predict. We know and we can expect Germany is going to have a cold winter, okay? Um, but sometimes the weather is going to say it's going to rain today, and then it actually doesn't. And then um, you had changed all your plans because it was going to rain, and then, you know, it was all for naught because it ended up being a sunny day or something like that, right? We've all had those experiences where we get angry at our weather app. So, um, yeah, weather, not as easy to predict. It's kind of those day-to-day -day fluctuations, but there's a general trend line in, in the climate that we can predict, okay? Now, remember, climate change is the change of climates. And so this is a system of um, mapping out different climates here in the Earth, okay? And all these letters up here basically are different factors of is it dry, is it wet, is it hot, is it cold, um, does it snow, that kind of thing. And so we kind of color coded these regions. And what we're seeing here, we're going through time. We're going to the future. We start with 1981 and we go all the way to 2100. And we're seeing how do we expect climates to change? This is a map of what we think the climate change or the change of climates is going to look like. All right? Notice you'll see um, Russia and Canada. You can definitely see changing up there as we see less and less ice up here in Greenland and you see, even you see some like greening happening right there. Okay, you see the climates changing. All right, there's another word that you need to know for this, um, for this unit. And so here's a new term. This is called net primary productivity. Net primary uh, productivity. Um, this is just one way to quantify the effects of climate on the biotic characteristics of biomes, okay? So um, th this is a way to measure how an ecosystem is doing biotically, all right? And we abbreviate it NPP. So if I ask you about NPP, I'm talking about net primary productivity. The way we define it is that it's the amount of biomass remaining after cellular respiration. Well, what does that mean? So when we think of biomass, you're thinking of typically wood or plant material, okay? That's at least how all biomass in an ecosystem starts off is plant material. If animals eat it, then it becomes part of their biomass, but originally it came from the plants going down the food chain, right? So uh, what is the process that creates that biomass? It's driven by light, okay? It's called photosynthesis. So you have photosynthesis is building wood and building plant material. And cellular respiration, remember, that's one of your really important reactions that we talked about in semester one. Cellular respiration is a process through which plants or animals burn that energy, okay? They burn that food. So if you make a certain amount of, um, you make a, a certain amount of wood, and then the tree is also going to use some of that sugar, whatever is remaining, that is the net primary productivity. Okay, when you think of the word net, if you think of net in financial terms, for instance, net is just referring to what's left over after you've um, subtracted what you've um, spent, right? So for instance, if I were to go to, let's say the chicken man truck and I were to get 
um, some chicken. Uh, if I give him uh, 10 euros and he gives me change and gives me three euros back, what was the net cost on my part? The net cost on my part would have been seven euros. Okay. So if I create, let's say I'm a tree and I create 10 cubic meters of wood. Okay. But I use up three cubic meters because I got to, I got to, metabolize some of those sugars that I've made for energy, then in reality, I'm left with seven cubic meters of wood. That's the biomass that my tree is actually going to take on. Okay. That's the, that's the amount of wood. Okay. We've actually measured this in our forest here. So this is the Condren forest, um, NPP cube. All right. This is a big yellow cube. I don't know if, um, any of you have seen it. It's right up across from BFA. So you, if you walk up, um, if you're at the front office and you just walk up that hill into the forest, you'll come to it eventually in about 10 minutes. So this is hidden in the trees there. But the foresters put this up to visualize for us how much wood is created in the Condren ecosystem on a daily basis. And this cube is um, huge. Okay, here's a better picture of it right here. Um, this is an enormous cube and it's 23 cubic meters. So the Condren forest has 23 cubic meters of wood per day. That's the net primary productivity. So what that means is each tree, like the, the, the whole forest is producing more than 23 cubic meters of sugar, but the tree burns some of it in cellular respiration. And then about 23 cubic meters is remaining. Okay. So you're, um, you know, typically if let's say if you live in Condren, you might, if you have a wood stove or a fireplace, typically they're going to deliver firewood to you in a cubic meter. Okay. So that's like, if you've ever helped someone unload a truck full of wood or something, that's usually a cubic meter. So you got 23 of those truck loads of firewood being produced and remaining every day. That's the net primary productivity of our forest. That's just a way to measure how the Condren forest is doing. Okay. And because it's a forest, it's producing a lot of biomass, okay? And other biomes don't produce that much biomass as much as a forest does, okay? So think about this question. Which ecosystem has the greatest NPP or the net primary productivity, all right? Um, most of, the, almost all of these pictures in my presentation here are pictures that I took. So um, these are all ecosystems I've been in here. So here was the, Here's a desert in Arizona for option A. There you can see a bunch of Akotio um, trees and cacti on a uh, grassy hillside. Okay, or B, the alpine tundra. So this is a place in um, Switzerland here up in the mountains. Or C, the temperate forest in Condren, Germany. Okay, out of these three options, which has the greatest NPP? The option would be C, okay? The forest um, is gonna be creating a lot more biomass and a lot more of that mass through photosynthesis. Okay, alpine tundra doesn't have too much biomass. It has short plants, okay? The desert also, it has more plants than the alpine tundra, but still not as much as those big bulky trees, okay? You kind of see all these little skinny twig-like trees there in the desert, but here, You've got a lot more wood being produced in the temperate forest. Okay, let's go for another option here. Which ecosystem has the least NPP? Okay, here's a salt marsh in South Carolina with, the, with a bunch of um, grasses here making up this marsh. Here's a glacier in Switzerland for choice B. And for choice C, there's rolling hills of grassland in the UK. Which has the least NPP? The answer would be B, okay? In fact, this has hardly any NPP in it, okay? It's just a glacier. Um, so it's basically just rock and ice. Now, there's probably some mosses growing there. Usually, those are the first plants to kind of show up in terms of succession. Um, but uh, the glacier really, yeah, is not producing that much. So... Um, that kind of biome where you have an icy biome like that really has a very low amount of NPP or stuff being produced through photosynthesis. Okay. 
So um, that NPP is just a term to a measuring factor that we talk about in, uh, when we talk about biomes. All right, let's talk about latitude. Okay, so uh, what is latitude? Well, uh, latitude is uh, one of the main factors that determines a region's climate. Okay, uh, and it's a measure of a place's distance north or south of the equator. Okay, so go ahead and write that down on number four. Latitude is a measure of a place's distance north or south of the equator. Okay. Um, so if you uh, kind of look at the center of the earth and you were to, let's say here's the center and you were just to go straight to the equator, that would have an angle of about zero degrees. But latitude is measuring, okay, what angle we're going from the equator, okay? So, for instance, 40 degrees north, okay, that's, uh, we're above 40 degrees north. I think we're at, I don't know, are we at 44? Something like that, okay. Um, so, 40 degrees north, you're about a 40 degree angle from the equator. What angle would the north pole be at? The north pole would be at a 90 degree angle, okay. Um so latitude ranges zero degrees at the equator to 90 degrees at the poles. Latitude is actually a measurement of the angle from the center of the earth to a point on its surface relative to the equator. Okay, so that's your other blank. It's a measurement of the angle from the center of the earth to a point on its surface. All right. Now, the opposite of latitude would be longitude. Those are the lines that go vertically around the earth, and we're not going to learn about longitude because longitude doesn't really determine a, um, a climate, okay? But climate is determined very much by a latitude, okay? So um, as we think about latitude, um, we're going to be thinking about what happens as you move away from the equator, okay? So if you were to, for instance, start at the equator somewhere in let's say Africa, and you were to drive all the way up, you know, uh, even if you have to take ferry or something like that, you were to drive all the way up to uh, southern Nor or sorry, northern Norway or something like that, trying to get as close as you would to the North Pole. How would things change around you on that very, very long car trip? Okay. Well, as the latitude increases, you're going to see that the sun is shining a lot less directly, okay? Uh, that has to do with the fact that the Earth is a sphere, okay? When you're at the equator, the, um, the, the equator of the Earth is pointing more directly towards the sun, and so you're going to get direct sunlight, uh, whereas the more north you go, it's kind of, you'll notice... You'll even notice this with like the sunsets, for instance, and even now in Germany, as it's uh, January, it's winter right, uh, right now, the sun kind of sets really low over the horizon. Whereas in the summer, you'll see it kind of, it's a little more overhead, but over time, as we get into the winter, you'll see the sun is really low along the horizon. It's shining less directly. And that's something that happens as you're more north or more south from the equator, but doesn't really happen at the equator. At the equator, the sun's usually right above you, okay? You'll definitely notice things get colder, okay? Um, things are going to be a lot more cold the more close you get to the North Pole or the more close you even get to the South Pole. But the closer you are to the equator, things are going to be warmer. So that's effect number two. Fact number three is that the day lengths change extremely over the year, all right? So it's, um, you'll notice that right now, daylight is about eight and a half hours or so. You'll have about eight and a half hours of sunlight, whereas in the summer, you'll have about 16 hours or so. So it's uh, here in Germany. So you see that extreme change. If any of you have ever lived near the equator, Things are pretty consistent uh, throughout the year. It doesn't change that much from the summer. It's not like the days are shortening and long and getting longer. They just stay kind of the same length as you're close to the equator. We'll talk about why that is, but that affects the climate.
Okay. Se number four, seasons are going to change extremely over the year. So we see that um, we have seasons here in Germany. You have autumn with the leaves falling. You see winter that is cold, a summer that is nice and warm. Whereas if you were to go to Africa, you actually, or maybe like middle of Africa or middle of South America around the equator, you wouldn't see that much change. You don't experience a snowy winter. Okay. You'll also notice that fewer species live, so there's less biodiversity as you move to the poles. So for instance, if you're in the jungle in the middle of the Brazil rainforest, okay, you're going to see a lot of species. But if you go to Greenland, you're not going to see as many species as you would in Brazil. Okay, so there's more species that live at the equator. Also, life produces less material, so there's less NPP, less net primary productivity, less of that stuff produced by photosynthesis, okay? So, um, again, if you were in the Amazon rainforest, you're going to see a lot more living matter, a lot more trees and wood and plants and animals, whereas if you go to Greenland, it's not going to be that much. You get closer to the poles, or if you go to Antarctica, okay, there's a lot of ice, there's not a lot of trees, okay? So there's less NPP the further you get towards the poles, either the north or the south. Okay, so those are effects one through six of moving from the equator to one of the poles, okay? Let's, uh, let's talk about number one just here, okay? If we talk about sun shines less directly, here on your notes, um, you will see this little diagram here that I drew for you. And obviously, it's out of scale. The sun is smaller than the earth, um, but that's okay. We're going to use it to help us understand how this works. All right. So uh, you'll notice at the equator, when the sun is shining, you, you see, let's imagine this sunbeam right here. Okay. Here's our sunbeam. And... Um, around here is is you're closer to the equator for sure on on this line all right you'll see that the the uh, ray of sunlight is shining very directly on this place right here whereas up here more northern okay the more north you go this single beam of sunlight when it hits the earth because it is um shining on this sphere near the top of the sphere. Notice how it gets spread out like this, okay? So here, this same amount of sunlight covers less area. It's more focused and more direct. Whereas up here, that's very spread out. It's almost like you're taking um, a piece of butter and spreading it along toast, okay? You're taking this single ray of light and you're spreading it across the earth. And each little piece of the earth is getting a little less light because it's being spread out so thin okay so um that's that's what happens as you move up with latitude and you can draw this little thing inside the earth right here latitude as you move up in latitude okay you're going to see more direct sunlight at the equator and less direct sunlight up here I don't know what your favorite pastime as a child was. One of my favorite pastimes was sitting above an anthill with a magnifying glass under the summer sun. And it was so fun. I would, this is, yeah, sounds really bad, but I would take the magnifying glass and I would focus it over the anthill and, you know, it focuses the sunlight. And so each ant that would come out of the anthill would, pop, it would, it would hit the beam of sunlight that I was magnifying on it, and it would just burn the ant, and you'd start making popcorn out of all these ants that would come out. Um, it was very entertaining um, as a child. And uh, what would happen was if you shown that direct beam very directly, then it would for sure burn the ants. But if you kind of moved and glanced the magnifying glass so that the light was spread out more, you would have noticed that 
no, no, no ants were ever going to burn. Okay. And it was simply because you're spreading that same beam of light. It's the same amount of light, but when you spread it over a larger surface area, it's less direct and it's not actually going to give as much heat. So that's why we actually see near the equator. It's a lot warmer than it is at uh, north or south because of the spherical shape of the earth. Here's another illustration of that, okay? Sun strikes more directly at the equator, whereas there's a low angle of incoming sunlight. So it's colder, okay? If we look at day, uh, or number three, okay, day lengths change extremely over the year. Let's talk about how long a day is in June versus in December, okay? Let's look at Copenhagen, Denmark here. How long do you think a day is, like the daylight with the sun shining in June in Copenhagen? Go ahead and write on your piece of paper just a number. Just give it a guess. What do you think? How many hours of sunlight is there in June? All right. It's a 17-hour, 30-minute day. So you have the sun is shining for 17 hours in Copenhagen in the middle of June. Okay. What do you think it is for December? Go ahead and just, just write it down on your paper. Give it a guess. How many hours do you think of sunlight are happening in December? Only seven hours. Okay. So it was only seven hours. So that changes extremely over the year. You have days are shortening in December. And then right after Christmas, they start lengthening again. Okay. Now, if we were to go to Cameroon, which is really close along the equator. Okay. What do you think the day length is in June? Just write it down. How many hours? 12 hours and 16 minutes. Okay. Now, what do you think it is for December? Go ahead and write this number down. What do you just, just, what do you think? Give it a guess. 12 hours. Okay. So there's only a 16 minute difference between a June day and a December day in the closer you are to the equator. Okay. We'll talk about why that is, but yeah, just for now, you can see how they change extremely. Okay, let's look at Cape Town, South Africa. Okay, again, we're moving farther away from the equator. Give it a guess. Write down your guess. Okay, what do you think is the amount of daylight that Cape Town has in June? Nine hours and 54 minutes. Now, you may have been tricked because you may have put something above 12 hours, like 15 hours or 17 hours or something like that. But remember, in the Southern Hemisphere, things are reversed from what they are in the Northern Hemisphere. So keep that in mind. How many hours of sunlight do you think are in December? 14 hours, okay? So in, in South Africa, they have longer days in December which means when is their winter? Well, their winter is in June, okay? And their summer is in December, okay? So Southern, like in Australia, you probably heard that, okay? In Australia, um, you have 14 out, you would have a long December day in December. It's, Christmas is in the summer for Australia. Um, and then the winter would be during June. So keep that in mind. Things are a little bit reversed, but you still have days are changing ex extremely over the year. The farther you get away from the equator, which is going to be very drastic when we get to the North Pole and the South Pole. And we'll talk about what those days are like in the North Pole and the South Pole. OK, look at number four. Seasons change extremely over the year. OK, here is a picture of Arizona. When do you think I took this picture? Oh, I took it in December, okay? In the summer, Arizona looks pretty much like what Arizona looks like in the winter. It The leaves don't really change. It's still, you, you ha it looks really hot and deserty, right? Okay, it's not going to change that much. 
Now, Arizona is a little closer to the equator than Ohio is. And so when I moved to Ohio, I experienced four different distinct seasons. There was this beautiful tree that I took several pictures of. This is the same tree, um, but to fit it into the picture, I have two. Uh, it looks like there's two trees, but it's the same tree. And I took um, from the same position uh, pictures of this tree throughout the seasons. And so um, you can see it changing color and then losing all of its leaves. This was just the most beautiful. It was an Acer rubrum. Um, gosh, what is the a uh, red oak tree? Did I? No, sorry, red maple tree, sugar maple tree. One of those. Um, I think it was a red. Yeah, Acer is a maple tree. And so uh, this was a beautiful tree, and they cut it down. And I was really disappointed that they cut this tree down. And they built a Chick-fil-A on top of where it was. So I don't know which is better, a Chick-fil-A or a beautiful tree. I kind of like both of them. But that tree no longer exists. Anyway, so the more north you get, like Ohio is going to be a lot more north of Arizona, you're going to see more seasons, right? Oh, there's another picture. Okay, here's um, a picture here in Condern. So on this is the same image of the of Riedlingen, but we're going through the seasons and so you'll see the left is autumn the middle is winter and then on the right we're kind of coming out of winter and going into spring so i like taking pictures from the same angle and looking at it over time to see how it changes and then trying to match them up you'll see the roofs all fit i tried to fit all the roofs together so yeah same image different seasons okay uh, here's another one here's at the top of a hill in uh, Riedlingen. And then in the winter, that's that same location, okay? So summer, winter. You can see the, the um, you can see where the trees and the houses are the same, okay? Trees are there. But this is only something that happens the further you get away from the equator. This would not, you would not see this drastic change from here's nice spring with flowers to here's a crazy wintry wonderland with snow everywhere you don't see that happen at the equator but you do see that happening as the um seasons change throughout the course of the year farther away from the equator okay so why are there more species and biomass at the equator well you can watch this video to find out i'll put this video inside of the um links for today all right. Uh, so let's just review what um, here's, here's some questions here. Here we have an image of the earth. It's tilted on its axis and we've got locations A, B and C. And this is what the earth looks like Okay, on June. So uh, which location has the most direct sun year round? A, B or C? Go ahead and think in your head. Okay, the answer would be C. That's the equator. The equator is going to have the most direct sunlight. Okay, right now on June 21st, if this is what this looks like, then section A has the most direct sunlight right now. Uh, but in December, it's actually going to be pointed the other way and it's going to be getting a, hardly any sun at all. Okay, so C over the average at the equator, you're going to have more direct sun throughout the year. Okay. Which location has the longest days in June? The answer for this one is A, all right? So um, in June, the more north you go, okay, you see longer days happening in June. In December, it would have short days, but in June, long days, okay? Which location has the most species, most likely? The answer is again C. Okay, the closer you get to the equator, the more species you are more likely to see. Which location has the least amount of NPP, net primary productivity biomass? The answer is A. All right, uh, you're going to see a lot less primary productivity the further you get away from the equator. All right. So uh, a couple things here. When we talk about latitude, we also have to talk about altitude. Okay, altitude is another word for that would just be elevation. Okay, and this is a measure of distance above sea level. So go ahead and write that in your notes under C. 
as with latitude, so with altitude. Okay, so altitude's the same thing as elevation. It's basically how far you're going up from sea level. Okay, so for instance, if you climb a mountain, you are climbing an altitude. You're going up an altitude. Okay, so if you increase in latitude, you go away from the equator, you're going to also increase or decrease in temperature. It's going to get colder. Well, what happens if you hike up a mountain? Okay, if you've ever hiked up a mountain, what happens as you get nearer to the top? The temperature decreases. It gets colder the higher you go. Okay. Why is that? Well, it's not the same reason as latitude. Okay. The higher you go in latitude, it gets colder because the sunlight is less direct. But for the, a mountain, the higher you go in a mountain, it gets colder because the air is less dense. Okay. It contains fewer air particles the higher you go up, and it's not going to carry or hold very much heat because you have fewer air particles. Remember, heat is just how those particles kind of bounce around and hit each other. But if you don't have very many particles, you're not going to have very much heat. Okay. So um, what this and, – and, and you know air is less dense the higher you go up. You're going to experience less oxygen. Okay. Um, so – over this this past summer, I hiked up a mountain in Wyoming, and we were probably at 68% the normal level of oxygen. So it was the amount of oxygen that you were getting decreased by 32% um, of the normal levels. And so the, the higher you go up, the less air there is. And that, that's just because gravity is going to bring the air particles down closer. So the farther you are away from the center of gravity, the more you're um, spread out those particles are going to be, there's going to be less particles. Okay. So it's just, it gets colder, the higher you go up, just like the more north or more south you go. Okay. Um, now, because areas of higher elevations are colder, they have different biomes than lower elevations at the same latitude. So you're not even changing where you are on the earth, but just because you're going up a mountain, you're going to change the biomes as you go up, okay? Now, whenever I, whenever you kind of look in an environmental textbook, usually the prime example that they give for this concept is the Santa Catalina Mountains. And that, those just happen to be the mountains that I grew up under. So these are all, all pictures that I took here. Um, these are the mountains. This is where I lived, okay? Uh, so this is a view of Mount Lemon. And Mount Lemon was a very um, is a very well known mountain that you can really see the biomes change as you go up the mountain. So, for instance, when you're at the bottom of the mountain, uh, what you see is um, this kind of scenery. You see a desert. So this is the Sonoran Desert. You see lots of dry land, big cactuses. Here's some saguaro cacti. Um, I drove up it this past summer, and so these are some of these are some pictures from then. Okay, so you start at the bottom of the mountain and it's like a desert, okay? The higher you get up the mountain, it starts changing the biome into kind of an uh, oak woodland or a chaparral biome, which is more like a, a Mediterranean style kind of biome. So you see these succulents, you see these um, yuccas and agave plants and um, different, um, trying to remember what these bushes are called. Oh, I'm already forgetting. It's a red bark on a on a bush, and the name will come back to me later. But anyway, so these are the kind of plants that you would see. Um, you know, here here's a desert biome, and here's the kind of a plant you would see more north you go in the world, but also just the higher up you go a mountain. Okay, now you go up even further, you start seeing more temperate forests. The higher you go up, and then when you get to the very top of the mountain, it's snowy. And there's, um, you know, there's pine trees, conifer trees, okay? There's waterfalls that are frozen. So and these are all pictures in Arizona. You wouldn't really expect this. And yet, at the same time, there's a desert down below, okay? So as I go up the mountain, am I changing latitude? No, I'm remaining at the latitude that that mountain is at. But am I changing altitude? 
yes, I am going up a mountain. So I am changing in altitude. And so the kind of experience that I have driving straight up is going to be the same experience that I have if I were to very quickly drive from Southern America to Banff, Alberta in Canada, for instance. Okay. Um, the biome up here is the same biome that you would see in Banff in Canada. Okay. Um, even though it's the same latitude. Okay. As with latitude, so with altitude. So here's a, here's a picture to kind of illustrate that. And I want you to label this in your diagram here. Okay. So go ahead and draw altitude going up the mountain. Okay. So altitudes when you go up the mountain and uh, it kind of corresponds here to the latitude that we see here on the globe. So for instance, we see deserts kind of in this region on the globe, just like we'd see deserts at lower altitudes. At higher latitudes, as you move up, you start seeing temperate forests around this area in North America. And you also kind of see that halfway up the mountain. A coniferous forest or a boreal forest is what you'd see more in Canada. And that's what you're seeing here as you get to the top of the mountain. And then when you get to the very top of the mountain, you see snow and small plants. And that's kind of what you'd see in very northern Canada or Greenland, this kind of area. Okay, so a mountain as you move up corresponds to the kind of biome change that you would see as you move north. So go ahead and fill that out on your on your map. Okay, so um, I just want to show you something real quick here. If we uh, go to Let's go to iNaturalist here. Well, actually, first, let's, let's talk about this here. So sky islands. In biology, we call these sky islands. Yes, here I am on Wikipedia. That's fine. All right. Um, it, sky island is a really cool thing. And when you actually go up Mount Lemon, you'll see a lot of signs like, oh, the sky island cafe or whatever. And it's like people call, biologists call these things sky islands because they literally look like islands in the sky. Okay. Um, so here's, for instance, the, a view of those mountains here, and they're they're so high up. But what you see here are these little refuges of these are cold biomes. So it's almost like little islands of Canada in the desert. Okay, that's why we call them sky islands. Specifically, the the in Santa Catalina where those pictures were from down here in this area. Okay, those are called the Madrean sky islands. Okay. They're pine and oak woodlands. They're just, they're islands of Canada in the sky that are nestled into Arizona, okay? And um, they're super interesting to um, biology. So there's all sorts of um, species that you see on those mountains that you would normally only see up north, okay? So for instance, um, paintbrush is a type of um, really colorful plant here. So um, this past summer when I was on Mount Lemon, Okay, here's Mount Lemon. Uh, then I saw these colorful plants. Okay, now a couple weeks later, I went up to Montana and saw these paintbrushes, which are the basically the same kind of plant, slightly different species. Okay, but they're up in Montana. And so if I look at my map here, here's my map of observations. You'll see here I've got, these are the same biomes. The reason why is that this right here is a sky island, okay? This is a this is a mountain. So I have a high altitude, and high altitudes are going to have very similar biomes to northern latitude. High altitude is very similar to northern or higher latitude, okay? And you can kind of see this all, like if I look right here, if I zoom out on the map up, here's all these paintbrush species in, in Arizona, I can have a pretty good guess that all of these other locations are mountainous areas, okay? If I zoom here, look, Mica Mountain, okay? So all these other little splotches of where you see paintbrushes, these are all little mountain ranges, okay? Because those are all sky islands for them to exist in, okay? So um, let's go ahead and uh, finish 
off this first page here, talking about latitude and altitude. Okay, so what, let's think about this. Why does the Earth experience these effects of temperature and light as you go up in latitude? Okay, as you go more north or south of the equator. And why does the Earth even experience seasons? Okay, well, the answer is it's a combination of the Earth's spherical shape, the tilt of its axis, and its rotation around the sun. Or revolution around the sun. Okay, so... um. Normally, you'd turn to your neighbor here, okay? Why do we have seasons? Why are winters cold and why are summers hot? That's the, that's the question we're trying to ask. Why are winters cold and why are summers hot? Think about that, okay? Yeah, most students, when I ask them this question, if I ask them to draw a diagram of the seasons, this is the diagram that they'll show me. Okay, so they'll show me, they'll, they'll draw something where, hey, here's the earth, it's far away from the sun, and here's the earth, it's closer to the sun as it goes around the sun. And most students would say, right here, when I'm closer to the sun, that's when we have summer. And when I'm far away from the sun, that's when we have winter. That's what most students would say. I have winter as I'm farther away and summer as I'm closer to the sun. And that seems to make the most sense to people. Now, here's something to pop that little bubble of understanding that you have here. It's January when the Earth is in this position. The 3rd of January is when the Earth is closest to the sun. And the 4th of July is actually that on that day, we are farther away from the sun than we are on any other day in the year. So if you said that the summer is when we're farther away from the sun, actually, the 4th of July, is, which is in most of our summers, okay, and what we, um, for most of us who live in the northern hemisphere, we would say that July is summer. So we're actually farther away from the sun. So this whole understanding of, oh, we're closer to the sun, we're farther away from the sun, affects the seasons, makes summers cold and winters hot. That's actually not true. And that's probably the biggest misconception that most students have. So what does cause the seasons to happen? All right. Well, we're going to explore how the Earth's tilt and orbit affects the climactic zones. You're going to turn to page two of your notes 4.1. And we will, um, you'll go to a different YouTube video. You'll go to a different video here, a different lecture here to talk about how seasons occur. So you can turn to page two, and I have a different link for that video. All right, that is the front page of notes 4.1.